Hello and welcome to the first episode of the On The Fossil Record podcast, the podcast for some things paleo, with Dean Lomax and myself, Jason Sherbin, and we're going to be chatting about some of Dean's recent research on ichthyosaurs. So, Dean, by happy coincidence, you've actually just had a study published, which we can talk about today, on something called Proto-Ichthyosaurus. Yeah, it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah, so the full name, Proto-Ichthyosaurus Prostaxis, I kind of feel I, like... I wasn't going to try that bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that to you. Yeah, no, that, that's totally fine. I kind of feel like it needs to have a nickname. In fact, that's something I mentioned to the museum curator, that they need to have a nickname. So, you know, you can imagine many of the kids going up, What's that? Proto-Ichthyosaurus prostaxalis. <laughs> so I think it's important that they have a nickname for this animal. Any ideas? I don't know, kind of something original like Icky the Ichthyosaur, but I don't know, maybe Fred. Fred. <laughs> could be could be a good one. And uh, Proto-Ichthyosaurus, the, the name makes it sound like it's almost an Ichthyosaurus, but uh, an Ichthyosaur, but it actually is an Ichthyosaur, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So just, uh, just for anyone listening who's not sure what an Ichthyosaur is... You, you study them a lot now, don't you? So yeah, that's... Go, go ahead. Yeah, as you know, yeah. So I spent a decade studying ichthyosaurs. So these are a really fantastic group of animals to study. They kind of resemble dolphins and sharks in their sort of overall body plan. But they are reptiles, and they lived at the same time the dinosaurs were sort of walking on land. But they lived in the seas, first appearing about 250 million years ago, and sadly becoming extinct about around about 90 million years ago but they are as i mentioned you know a really fantastic group of animals to to study and yeah proto ichthyosaurus as you say it does kind of sound like it's uh, um you know before ichthyosaur but it's not it is a, an example of an ichthyosaur first described back in 1979 by a paleontologist called dr robert appleby and um What's what's so special about Proto Ichthyosaurus that you're, you're trying to tell the world about it at the moment? So, so I've spent the last probably five or six years looking at Proto Ichthyosaurus. So when when Dr. Appleby first described it, he kind of um, he looked at a, well a handful of specimens, sort of I think it was about four or five specimens, and he found a really weird forefin. So he found that in the forefins of Proto Ichthyosaurus, they had a certain number of digits, so a certain number of fingers in their forefin, which was basically unique among all ichthyosaurs in the world at that time, and in fact even is today. But one thing that he hadn't sort of realised is that he had mistaken a couple of his Proto Ichthyosaurus specimens for being uh, fakes. There was a couple of them in there where they'd been made up by sort of one or two different ichthyosaurs. So he had one fin from a proichthyosaurus and one fin from another type of ichthyosaur, funnily enough, called ichthyosaurus. And so since his paper came out, since his study came out in 1979, literally a few years later, every other ichthyosaur worker said he's wrong. And um, it was kind of really critical of his work. And, you know, you can imagine he spent quite some time looking at that and for it just to be disregarded because... Essentially, people said, oh, they're just, you know, they, they didn't even recognize that they were fakes as well. They just assumed that they were, um, you know, just a variation of Ichthyosaurus. So this was just another fourth in variation. And so anyway, so working on that for the last sort of five or six years, going over his specimens and others, we've now worked with a colleague of mine, Professor Judy Misere. She and I, we have examined and found up to almost 30 specimens now of Proichthyosaurus, wow. and including uh, naming one new species in 2017, which was um, <clears throat> a specimen at the um, uh, University of Nottingham, which actually we named after Appleby, so it's called Proichthyosaurus applebii. And so that was kind of like a big chunk of work that we'd done um, you know, we've actually published a couple of papers now on Proichthyosaurus, so recognising these sort of um, newly discovered specimens. Most of, well, all of them being hidden in museum and university collections. But that kind of brings us around to this new study, which you know you talked about. And um, this is an important new study in, in respect to ichthyosaurs, at least. That it's a really rare specimen. It's it was originally found in a farmer's field in 1955. Imagine that. 
<laughs> being I've, found in a farmer's field. I'm not sure I've ever found anything useful in a farmer's field. Yeah, me neither. Me, me neither. It was a funny story. Again, it was one of these things where, as you know, being a paleontologist, that you know museums are just treasure troves for collections and things like that. And you know, you, you literally could walk into a museum collection and you could find something entirely new to science. And I mean, that's what I've, I guess I've been doing for the last decade, looking in museums, just going over sort of historical specimens, what people have collected and looked at. And in some cases, like this one, this specimen, as I said, was found in Farmer's Field 1955. At the time, even this guy, Robert Appleby, Dr. Appleby, he even examined the specimen and he thought that it might be something new to science. And anyway, it was collected from this field and it was a, I should point out what it is as well. So it's a really large skull. It's about a meter long skull and there was a partial skeleton with it as well. So there's one of the, the four fins, there was a hind fin and lots of the backbone. So lots of the vertebral column and that specimen then was put into sort of like the Birmingham Museums um, sort of trust and then it was spread between different a couple of different museums but right at that time um, sort of like 1956 57 and sort of Appleby looked at it and a few other people looked at it and then it was kind of like research just well it just never happened they kind of just assumed I think they thought it was just another example of a common ichthyosaur one of the most common ichthyosaurs in the UK which you're familiar with Jason uh, ichthyosaurus communis and then that was it so it's kind of left in a you know in the museum's basement i guess for for many years i think it did go on display at one point but yeah so what was it when um your your friend and colleague nigel larkin was it was it him getting involved with um conserving this specimen that you ended up getting involved with studying it yeah pretty much so yeah nigel had been asked to uh, to work on this specimen in sort of like it was middle of 2014 and I'd been working with Nigel as well and obviously at that time I'd been I'd already written quite a few research papers on ichthyosaurs and so Nigel had mentioned to the museum curator of the museum where this, this specimen is held the think tank museum in Birmingham uh, a, a curator called Luan Mahitia and Luan also uh, sort of realized I've been working on ichthyosaurs and said to Nigel is it worthwhile um, sort of having Dean involved and could the two of you work on the project? You know, you, sort of Nigel could come serve it whilst I could help him sort of take the specimen apart, take the skull apart. Because one of the problems with the, the skull was that it was, um, it was I mean, it's a beautiful skull. It's three, it's pretty much preserved in three dimensions, which is really rare for, a, for, a, for an ichthyosaur of this age. It's about 200 million years old, lived during the early Jurassic. And uh, most ichthyosaurs from that time are, the most scientific term, pancake. <laughs> I, was, I was about to, to ask you about that term. Yeah. I thought it's, it's an interesting term you've been using. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, reading up on this one. <laughs> so pretty much they're pancakes. So you know you think Squish. of squash. They're squished. So you you think of them being sort of like um, you know from the top down being squished out. So the you know you they're pretty much preserved in either from the top view, the bottom view, or if if not, they're laying on their left or right side, and that's usually how we get them. And you know usually most of them you think of ichthyosaurs in the UK that there's probably well there's thousands of ichthyosaurs known many come from Dorset Somerset from Whitby and then from other locations so for for this one um, being three dimensionally preserved was really quite rare and that's what really sort of enticed me to the project especially with it being you know quite a big animal a meter long skull and we estimate that this entire length of the animal up to probably between 3.2 and 4 meters in length so the sort of top size for a common bottlenose dolphin so pretty pretty decent sized animal and uh, you've been using some very modern techniques on this haven't you a bit of CT scanning and some 3D printing as well yeah yeah quite a bit of that yeah so as part of this sort of project I say it started in 2014 and a year later in 2015 me and Nigel sort of teamed up with uh, an excellent paleontologist who at the time was at the University of Cambridge Dr Laura Porro and then now she's at University College London and Laura is sort of world renowned I should say really for like um, for, having, for being able to CT scan specimens and sort of manipulate the data and and um, use that data to sort of like build three-dimensional models of the fossils. So she's done that quite a lot in different fossils, and so she thought this would be a fantastic project to get involved in. So working with uh, with Laura, she first of all we had sort of um, individual bones from the skull, which um, some of them are really rare. You've got parts of the brain case preserved, so you know the, obviously the bones that surround the the actual brain, and in some instances, some of those bones show impressions of the brain, which is which is quite amazing. Are there, are there any other examples of um, ichthyosaur brain cases? Preserved. Yeah, there are. So there's a handful of specimens um, dotted around the world, but 
in the UK, that is one of probably, you know, yeah, very few, especially if it's age. There's there's only, thinking about it, thinking out loud, probably what, couple, two or three maybe known. And one of them was sort of like an acid prepared one. So it was a specimen that was preserved in a big rock and it was all sort of removed. The, the rock was removed by acid preparation, pouring acid on the rock. So that was dissolved away and then you're just left with the bones. So in this case, obviously for this think tank, uh, ichthyosaur, that was slightly different that it was preserved. And I think it was preserved in a, in a clay and all the clay was removed. So you had some of the, well, you had the bones uh, left, but um, yeah, so so using the the scanning data, though um, we we micro CT scanned the brain case bones and the individual bones in the skull, um, so we could look inside, so so like the internal structure of those bones and see what we could find in there, and then the entire skull itself, we had that CT scanned at the Royal Veterinary College in London, which uh, was the scanner is usually used for sort of like horses and things like that. So we attempted to climb in. I was tempted to climb in, see what I look like under there, the side, the side of this uh, this ichthyosaur. So it was, yeah, it was really neat. And um, by doing that, I mean you know, you know yourself. Obviously, we didn't have access to those things, you know, going back many years and that. So you know, realistically, CT scanners and micro CT scanners and so on and so forth have really opened up an entirely new area for paleontologists to explore and and look it's, inside um, the fossils. I know I know you're passionate about being able to share information with other scientists and the public. CT scanning, 3D printing, that that just makes all of this even easier in a way, doesn't it? You can you can send these files over to someone. They can print their own uh, parts if you've got 3D printing going on. They can look at these CT scanned images from the other side of the world without having to come over and look at the specimen or having to send it overseas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, and that's that's something that's really important now because, you know, in theory, we could send over all of these scans to, let's say, a colleague of mine in South America, and they could, if they have access to a three D printer, they could literally print out a three dimensional version of our research of that skull. And then they could look at it as well, and you know maybe they could come to the same conclusions that we have in our in our study, or maybe they might find something else that's new. Because as you say, it's um, it's really quite good to have that. And and in fact, with that skull, we did have various parts of it, and in fact, parts of the skeleton, three D printed. And that was by a guy called Stephen Day of uh, ThinkSee Three D in, uh, in in Oxfordshire, and uh, he he did a fantastic job with that. I mean, you look at the skull now, if you look at the specimen. You literally would find it very difficult to tell what which is real and which was the the replica, and you know it's important to do that because the specimen is now on display at the Think Tank Museum in Birmingham. Although it did go on display a year or so ago now, and it's so it, it, all of the <laughs> the text needs to be updated since this new study. <laughs> and um, obviously, with three D printing, not necessarily this specimen, but three D printing fossils, you can send these out to to schools and and other educational places and children can handle these without risk of damage in the actual fossil and it's a it's a valuable resource i agree yeah that's really important and the, the thing is obviously you know that there's a lot of research that's published every year from paleontologists and you know it could be a new dinosaur it could be a a new fossilized squid it could be you know like out of my my ichthyosaur research and and i think it's it's important that potentially you know a lot of school children and gen, well general public will see that and you know they may, may wish to see more of it if they can't actually go and physically see the specimen in birmingham if they have access to a, a 3d printer or even just a computer to look at the sort of uh, th uh, three-dimensional skull on the computer you can play around the entire skull so you know, it has opened up such a an unusual niche, and you know, potentially, I suspect, to give it you know a few more years, three D printing will probably come a lot cheaper, and you know, schools may be able to have access to these things, which they can print off you know at their leisure, which would be pretty cool. Going back to some of this, uh, some of the CT scanning, I read that um, you found evidence of past curation where they'd reconstructed parts of the, the fossil, <laughs> and you, you, this wasn't obvious until you CT scanned it. Yeah, that's true, actually, uh, Jason. I says, yeah, it's really true. So, as part of this con con as part of this conservation, <laughs> not this conversation, not this conversation, <laughs> as part of this uh, conservation project that Nigel led in 2014-15. So, working with him on that, so he he pretty much cleaned the entire skull and and the skull specifically, 
and he took off literally so much sort of old glue, even animal glues and things like that. And he, we found like wood and plaster and stuff built into the into the skull into the skeleton. And it wasn't necessarily done for sort of like deceptive purposes to sort of say, hey, this is more complete than what it is. It was literally done just for aesthetics. So if it was going to go on display, it would look more complete. But the thing is, once it was all cleaned up, I then worked with Nigel. We put the skull back together, sort of more anatomically accurate, still not 100% accurate because some of the bones were still quite heavy, so you couldn't sort of, you know, put them in the right order or whatever. But what we ended up doing was um, having it scanned was there was a bunch of um, things in the skull that actually were made of plaster and we had no idea you look at the the bone one of them was a a bone right at the back of the the brain case called the supra occipital and that to me i'd looked at it several times and not even questioned that it its authenticity when we had that scanned there was one portion of it It wasn't a lot but there's probably i don't know made up less than a quarter of it was actually uh, (laughs) faked if you like it was made up of plaster and so it was done so expertly well so uh, having access to these scanners and things is important even in that respect because you know historically many of these things weren't necessarily collected for the scientific value they were collected because you know they were just something nice to have on the mantelpiece so to speak so you know if you go back 150 200 years many of these specimens very very much may well have been sort of set into plaster or cement or something like that does it make you want to kind of go around loads of museum collections and just see what you can find that's (laughs) fake that was really convincing yeah yeah i think yeah that'd be a pretty cool idea wouldn't it actually yeah going around with a some sort of like handheld scanner or something like zoop, that's one <laughs> yep tick that one off tick that one off yeah i think that'd be that's pretty the cool future of paleontology dean yeah there you go i think there's a series in that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, uh, it does um it does actually make me think of, of good old Fizzy the Hippias or how you actually had to show that that was real early on in your career, didn't you? Yeah, that's it, yeah, talking of nicknames and stuff, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. I, mean, I did think of that earlier on when yeah, you, you mentioned point, coming yeah. up with a nickname for it. All I could think was, uh, for, for those who don't know, uh, Fizzy the Ichthyosaurus was kept in, was it the education collection yeah, at yeah. Doncaster Museum and Art yeah. Galleries? Um and they thought it was a cast. Yes. And children had genuinely done crayon <laughs> rubbings and things on this <laughs> yeah. fossil. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting story, and quite rightly, as you say, just building on, up on top of that. So I was, uh, at the time, I was 18. I'd come back from working in, in America, working in Wyoming, sort of digging up dinosaurs. I came back to my hometown, Doncaster, got in touch with Doncaster Museum and inquired what they had in terms of fossils. And uh, I began volunteering at the museum, and they said, oh, we have a fantastic ichthyosaur. And as J- Jason's pointed out there, it turns out this ichthyosaur, which they thought was a cast, was real. And I identified it as real and it even had its last meal preserved between, <laughs> between its ribs, which ended up forming my first scientific paper. It had uh, tiny, like super tiny hooks, hook shaped things preserved in a, in a large sort of dark mass between the ribs. And they were the, they are the hooks from the arms of uh, sort of prehistoric squid. So we know that it was feasting on squid before it died. And, and then uh, leading on to, to what you say is that, yeah, it turns out that was a, <laughs> was a new species as well. And the first new species I'd named, and we nicknamed it Fizzy, but we named it after um, the early... Uh, late Georgian, early Victorian paleontologist Mary Anning of, uh, of Lyon Regis Dawson um, we named it Ichthyosaurus Anningae in, in her honour. Having looked at that education collection myself and that's an amazing specimen but I do remember they've got some Archaeopteryx uh, sort of casks there haven't they yeah, and, and yeah. one of them I do remember was just absolutely awful yeah. Just, yeah. I'd, I'd love it if it turned out to be real but it was it's <laughs> one of the worst casts I've ever seen yeah. Archaeopteryx <laughs> number 13 hiding, <laughs> hiding in Doncaster Museum that'd be, uh, that'd be funny well you, you never know in fact you remember there was the bones that were apparently said to be from Conisborough in Doncaster and they're identified as possible deer and they were from uh, giant flightless birds from New Zealand <laughs> <laughs> so, you know who knows what's in the wonders of Doncaster Museum's basement? Well, I guess me and you, really. We should know. <laughs> we should. We, we, did, uh, we did spend a lot of time down there. <laughs> we, we were allowed to go in, by the way. We, uh, we didn't just sneak into the basement. Yeah. Um, well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Thanks for listening to the On The Fossil Record podcast.
This podcast was brought to you by Dean Lomax, Jason Sherbin, and Peanut the Dog for this well-timed sneeze. So, Dean. All music has been written and produced by Jason Sherbin.